year, Pennsylvania Supreme Court determined that the state's 2011 congressional district maps to be in violation of the free and equal clause of the Pennsylvania State Constitution and mandated redistricting of the state to guarantee more proportional representation in the United States Congress. This change just prior to our spring primary created two new districts in York County, the 10th covering the middle to northern half of York County and the 11th covering the southern portion of the county. Uh, Congressman Scott Perry and George Scott are running in the redrawn 10th district, which includes all Dauphin County, parts of Cumberland, and the middle to northern part of York County. I did get a call right before our meeting asking whether these guys are actually our congressmen. They are. <laughs> uh, because the, the way the new map is drawn, it basically takes the city of York, its surrounding municipalities, and kind of wedges north. Uh, if we have the opportunity in the spring, uh, we will have whoever wins the 11th congressional district in to, to meet the club also. In my introductions, you will see some similarities to each candidate. In particular, we are thankful for their willingness for public service, but also for their combined military service to our country. The format of our program is a one and a half minute opening statement by the candidates. The order is drawn by lot, and uh, uh, George will be going first, followed by Scott, and then the close uh, will be the exact opposite. Questions have been submitted by our membership. Thank you, members. Uh, we had more than 50 uh, good questions uh, submitted to us. There are a few that were not so good. <laughs> <laughs> I assure you I selected the ones that were. <laughs> They've only been seen by myself, and for the most part, I tried to keep the original wording of, of the asker, with the exception of, of trying to find clarity or to pull two or more questions together into one. Each candidate has two rebuttal cards, the coveted rebuttal cards, and uh, they can utilize those to extend their remarks at any time uh, for the conclusion of the remarks of their opponent, uh, either to extend their own remarks or to rebut their opponent. Each candidate uh, has a two-minute close, and as I mentioned, we will be going in the opposite order of the uh, start. Now, for the introductions. The, Democratic nominee for the 10th congressional seat is George Scott. George was raised on a family farm in south central Pennsylvania, and growing up, he learned the value of hard work and service to his family and his local community. After graduating from college, George entered the U.S. Army and for 20 years served our nation in both peace and war. He was deployed for operations just cause, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, and then Enduring Freedom. He retired as Lieutenant Colonel after commanding a battalion of 1,800 soldiers. In 2009, he returned home and responded to a different calling, one of faith. George attended Gettysburg Lutheran Seminary, earning a Master of Divinity, and began serving as a pastor in East Berlin. And he is currently on leave from his congregation to continue pursuing his lifelong call to serve, this time as an elected representative of the people. George has dedicated his life to upholding the values of integrity, service, and compassion. George has deep roots in South Central PA, and because of that, he believes that he understands the issues that affect the voters of the 10th Congressional District today. George lives in Dillsburg with his wife, Donna, and their son and daughter. The Republican candidate for the 10th Congressional seat is Congressman Scott Perry. Scott grew up close to where he lives now in Carroll County and started work picking fruit at 13. He attended Northern York Public High Schools and Cumberland Perry Votech School, and Scott joined the military as a private when he was 18 and was employed as a dock worker, a draftsman, and a licensed insurance agent. After flight school, Scott worked full-time while put himself through college at Hack and Penn State, after which he opened a mechanical contracting business. During this time, Perry served locally on municipal committees and chaired the Carroll County Planning Commission. Perry attended the U.S. Army War College and currently serves at, at the rank of Brigadier General. Perry is commanded at the company, the battalion, and brigade level, was a commander of an aviation task force in Iraq where he flew 40 combat missions. In 2007, Perry was elected state representative of the 92nd Legislative District. In 2013, he was elected to the U.S. representative of the 4th Congressional District. Scott lives uh, uh, up north in Carroll County with uh, his wife Christy 
and their two daughters who attend public schools, and they belong to the Franklin Town United Brethren Church. So let's give them one round of applause. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As we move into the questions, I would ask that you hold your applause. Uh, we'll allow them to close, and then we will give them applause again. Uh, but that's to maximize the time we have today. So our first question, or excuse me, our first opening will go to George. Well, thank you to the Rotary Club of York for hosting this event, and to all of you for being here. My name is George Scott, and I'm running for Congress in the new 10th District. As you heard, I've spent my life in service first in our nation's army as an active duty army officer for 20 years, including a year in Korea and four years in the Middle East. But the best part of my military service was working with people of diverse backgrounds and coming together to solve tough issues. My service has continued for the last nine years right here in South Central Pennsylvania, serving my community and ministry. I'm a Lutheran pastor, and what I've learned is that many people in our communities are struggling to get by. Take, for example, a couple that I met over in Carlisle who would like to be retired but instead are both working, and the reason is because they can't afford the insulin they need as diabetics. So they're in their 70s still working to try and cover health care costs. That's why I'm running. I want to make sure that we have quality, affordable health care for everyone, to create better paying jobs, support strong, safe schools and to protect Social Security and Medicare. At the end of the day, these are issues that will improve the lives of the people in this district, and that is what this is all about. I'm running for you, for the people of this district, and my promise is that once you elect me, I will work for you and for you only. Again, my name's George Scott, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Yeah. Well, thanks to the Rotary for this opportunity and for your gracious invitation. Uh, and thanks for all your attendance. My story begins with my grandmother, who is a Colombian immigrant who came here literally with the shirt on her back. And because of that, she had to do tough jobs and, and things that probably other folks won't, uh, wouldn't do at the time to support her family. I don't know my father, so my mother's story is very similar. Tough jobs, and doing things to get by, and quite honestly, sometimes the things we had to do were humili hum humiliating and embarrassing. We were on assistance. We ate stuff that people were throwing away and so on and so forth, but we, we got through. Um, and uh, in that, I learned uh, a lot about the value of hard work and, uh, and, and sticking together as a family and, of course, my faith as well. I joined the Army when I was 18, uh, and I was able to start a business in, uh, uh, in, my, in my mom's garage. We started with a couple thousand dollars, which was everything we had in, in the world at the time. And over the course of my life, I watched veterans, kind of like the people I served, stand in line and be denied the care that they had earned. I watched my mom work and work her fingers to the bone, and then as she's retired and, and finally getting older, you know, struggling to worry about whether Social Security or Medicare is going to be there, and to worry about young folks that are trying to start a business where we have more business closures in America than business starts. That's why I've gotten involved for my mom, for the veterans, for people that want to start a business, and for everybody that wants to realize the full potential in America. Thank you. Very good. Okay, we're going to go on to our questions, and the first one's going to be revolving around tariffs and trade. <clears throat> on Monday, the White House announced the latest tariffs on $200 billion worth of imports from China. This is a follow-up to the other tariffs imposed on many other countries around the world. Do you support the President's policy of trade sanctions as the primary method to obtain better trade deals? Do you support the passage of legislation to reduce the President's ability to unilaterally impose trade sanctions? Scott, you're going to start. Well, while I don't really like tariffs and I see them as a tax, because that's literally, literally what they are on each of us and the goods that we buy, and just to let you know, as far as I know, the money goes right directly to the Treasury on tariffs that are collected, uh, I understand what the President's position is and what he's trying to do. Uh, we have been taken advantage of, and my experiences over my lifetime in all the little towns around York County, Cumberland, Dauphin County, Adams County that I've driven around, they each had a small business or two in it that kind of sustained the town. And all these businesses, or most of them, have gone away, and there's a reason for that. These other countries have taken advantage of us because we've allowed them to do that in the trade agreements we've made. While I don't like the tariffs, 
I understand where the president's trying to go, and I think we're, we're seeing some fruits of those labors with the EU, with Canada, with Mexico. I think finally Australia and Japan will get there. And literally, I think the, uh, the, uh, the, act, the worst actor of all that we need to get to and the president's focused on is China. And I think once we have the other folks where we need to be in a reasonable agreement, uh, we will be able to put some pressure on China and we'll be able to do much better for ourselves. So while I don't like the tariffs, I don't really see a better vehicle, and while uh, I'm concerned about any of the, uh, all the power being invested, invested in one person, at one agency, so to speak, or in the administration, the Congress, I think, would be uh, impotent in trying to uh, work these deals through multiple countries over a period of time. And so I think the president is the only place that that can happen effectively. Thank you. George? <coughs> so certainly there are bad actors when it comes to international trade, and China is at the top of that list. And uh, we do need to aggressively go head-to-head -head with China. And yet we need to recognize that there are existing systems to deal with trade issues. And for example, the United States wins 90% of the cases that we bring before the World Trade Organization. So as a general rule, I don't support unilateral tariffs as a policy. I think they're unwise, especially when they target allies like, like Canada or the EU, nations that have stood and fought alongside us in times of a very difficult uh, uh, endeavor for this country. In addition, these tariffs uh, have a negative impact on local businesses. Certainly, Hershey and Harley have been in the news as a result of these tariffs, but it goes down to even lower levels. Uh, family farms are being affected by this as markets for soybeans and other crops shut down. Um, construction is being affected as the price of raw materials uh, goes up, particularly steel. And there are other solutions. I'm not proposing that we take the lead away from the president completely, but I do think that uh, there's legislative uh, a role here. Uh, Senator Corker, in, in the Republican from Tennessee, has said that uh, I'll sponsor the bill that any time the president proposes tariffs on other nations for national security reasons, that it should require Congress's approval. And that bill has bipartisan support, and there's a uh, counterpart bill in the House, which I would be very happy to co-sponsor once elected. Okay, thank you. And George, just so you know, you'll be able to first on this next question. Uh, the next question revolves around guns, Second Amendment. Um, there have been ongoing horrific use of firearms against school children and the general public. What can be done legislatively to reduce such occurrences? And further, can the candidates please provide a direct answer on their position regarding civilian ownership of assault-style guns and or the use of bump stocks, the modification used in the Las Vegas assault? George. So we have got a major issue with gun violence, and we need to wrap our arms around it and do something about it and stop kicking this can down the road. Um, we are having too many vulnerable populations, particularly school children, but also churches and other gatherings that are being impacted by violence. And on top of that, the single largest source of gun death is suicide by men in their homes. So I think we need to uh, do several steps, some of them at the uh, legislative level. Um, first, we need to fund the Centers for Disease Control to do a study of what is the cause for this epidemic that we've got of gun violence. Second, we need to, uh, to move forward with universal background checks. These are supported by upwards of 85% of Americans. It's simply a way of identifying that someone that receives a weapon is someone that doesn't have a history of violence or doesn't have a serious mental health issue or isn't on the watch list. Those are, are things that we should do, universal background checks. Above and beyond that, I think there are ways to reduce the lethality of these weapons, and I do support banning bump stocks, which convert semi-automatics to automatics, as well as to uh, reducing or even potentially eliminating high-capacity magazines. As it goes for um, weapons that are meant for the battlefield, I think that we need to take a serious look at that and understand why someone needs those. I certainly don't want those near my church, near my school where my children are at. And at the end of the day, we do need to protect our schools and, uh, and, but I'm not in favor of arming teachers. We already asked our teachers to do more than enough. Every single one of us, especially those who are parents, but every single one of us knows children or has children. And not one of us wants to send our kids to, chill, to school and, and know or think or imagine that they won't come home safely to us. That is a, the, the horror that uh, some of our families in the United States have lived with. And, and I think that, like me, every single parent in the room thinks about that on a, on a regular basis. The answers are, are difficult to, uh, to find because we have a constitution which each of us takes an oath to uphold and defend, which 
enshrines it, as well as other things, the Second Amendment and our right to bear arms. And so where do you find, where do you find some common ground? Where do you find the safety and, and, keep the, uh, and keep your rights at the same time? I will tell you, I was privileged to meet with many of our superintendents who gave me, quite honestly, a different story than I thought I was going to hear. I thought I was going to hear one thing, and quite honestly, they said, one of them said, or two of them said, we need more counselors. We need funding for counselors because kids will talk to a counselor, not a guidance counselor, but another type of counselor specifically for this because they don't want to, they don't want to rat out. They don't want to dime out their friends, right? So the other one said, one, another one said, we need, some, uh, we need money for hardening our facilities because they're old and people are just able to walk in and out and we can't afford to, to harden the facility. Others said, we need money for resource officers. The answers, generally speaking, are locally among each school and each school district and what they want and what they feel will best protect them. <coughs> On the bump stock issue, the president issued, we were moving towards that legislation. The president issued an executive order, so they are now banned and assault style weapons is a definition. Anything can be an assault weapon. It, it, it depends on how it looks. I would just tell you this. Uh, it, did, it didn't work the last time it was tried. The assault weapons ban had no discernible effect on, on the safety of, uh, of people in the use of guns. So, thank you. Thank you. Scott, you'll be going next on the next yes, question. Uh, and we're moving on to borders. What is your position regarding protecting the U.S. border from illegal aliens and guns? Okay. Uh, again, as... Uh, as the proud grandson of an immigrant, and my great-grandmother and my grandmother came here, I am proud. We are mostly a nation of immigrants, but legal immigrants. Keep the people that came in, like my grandmother and, and uh, my great-grandmother, and their names are etched in the walls at Ellis Island, and I support that. The United States admits more immigrants to its country than any other country in the world, a million, over a million a year. But illegal, illegal immigration is a problem, and you don't have a country if you're not going to secure your border. Just like you, just like you lock your home at night. You don't let people just wander in and out of your home, and we can't let people wander in and out of our country without knowing what their intentions are. And not only that, not only that, and many of the people that come here seek a better life and really have no ill intent to anybody in this country or the country they came from. They are seeking, uh, they are they are fleeing horrific circumstances. But not everybody is that way. We've got gang members from MS-13 who have come into this country. We are bringing in a horrific amount of fentanyl that goes through China and comes through our southern border enough every single month, every single month to kill the entire population of the United States. And then there's the weapons trafficking and other drug, drug trafficking. I support a legal uh, immigration effort for our country. I voted as such. I voted for the bill that got 195 votes in the House. And, uh, and I think it's something that the House and the, and the Senate, the Congress in general, need to sorely get after. It has been too long where our immigration problem has been broken and is left unaddressed. So we certainly can and must secure our borders. And we do need comprehensive immigration reform. It's been uh, since the 1980s that we really had anything of real substance. But there's a way to secure the borders and do it compassionately and tearing children away from families, even families that are crossing um, without proper documentation, is not the way to do that. We can enforce our border security in a humane manner. And then for those who are here under programs such as DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival, we need to find a way to citizenship for these folks. These are people that have been in our nation, oftentimes for, for now decades, who came not as a result of their decision, but as a result of the decision of their parents, and who have become the citizens that we all want to be. People who have graduated our schools, started businesses, served in our military. So yes, um, immigration is essential to who we are. It's we are all immigrants. Uh, my mom was an immigrant. Uh, my father was an immigrant going back generations. But it's what makes our nation strong. And there's a way to do it that, frankly, doesn't focus on false news. The rate of crime amongst immigrants, both legal and illegal, is lower than the rate of crime amongst the population as a whole. So let's focus the issue on what really is going on here, which is we need to find a way to deal with the problem that we have of undocumented immigrants, but we need to do it humanely. Okay, thank you. George, you're going to go uh, answer this question next. We're going to stay on immigration, but something we really don't hear much about. We're going to flip the coin on its head. and. Uh, with unemployment at 3.9%, which historically is considered full employment, 
the baby boomers retiring at a record pace, 300,000 turn 65 every month. What is being or should be done with legal immigration to fill the coming shortfall <coughs> in available employees? So that's a great question. I think that's one that we often miss, particularly under the current administration. There's this knee-jerk reaction that all immigration is somehow bad. And, and, and that's, of course, not the case. We all know that all immigration is not bad. And then, in fact, with our economy being at or near full employment, we do need to increase the workforce. And so immigrants are a vital source for businesses. There are businesses within South Central Pennsylvania, right here within the 10th Congressional District, that frankly could not do what they do without immigrant labor. We see that particularly in agriculture, but we also see that in other industries. So we've got to figure out a way to, I would say, streamline immigration. And that gets back to the issue of comprehensive immigration reform. And if we're going to do that, and that, that fix is going to last, it needs to be a bipartisan solution. That's what I will pursue once elected, is bipartisan solutions. Because bipartisan solutions, particularly to tough, complex issues like immigration, those are solutions that are going to endure. And we need to make sure that we are finding a way to bring in the people that we need to allow our economy to grow and prosper in the decades to come. I've long said since I was elected that our immigration system is broken and you don't have to go too far to see that it is. Uh, we have a strong ag community in York County and uh, particularly the 4th Congressional District which also includes Adams County. And I've been an advocate for a three-year ag visa. There's no reason why uh, why an employer has no idea who's coming or whether the individual is coming from another country who just wants to come up for a temporary period of time and work has no idea whether they're going to make it. Neither one knows whether they're going to, the immigrant doesn't make it, the, the employer doesn't know whether that person is going to make it. And so that system is broken for a long time. In the bill that I voted for, we moved to a merit-based system because there are other problems with our immigration system which include the fact that we import, whether legally or illegally, too much low-skilled labor. And we need a certain amount, but remember, that takes jobs away from your child. When I started working picking food at 13, the only skill I had was to show up on time with a good attitude, right? And so when you don't have any skills, this is a place where you can get your start. And if we're importing a lot of this labor, then that takes our folks out of the labor force. As well, uh, we could reduce the country caps. Literally, we have people on different visa programs in our country that have been here for dozens and dozens of years and decades who can't become, they can't become citizens. They have to continue to work at the same location and, uh, and they can't start a business of their own. They, they have no uh, mobility in, in, in their employment because of the, the country caps and the problems we have with that. Those are issues that we sought to resolve. That's the bill I voted for. I've been trying to be part of the solution. We just came to get the rest of Congress there. Okay, thank you. Scott, you're gonna answer first on this yes, next sir. one. And we're going on to Social Security. As mentioned, we are in the middle of the baby boomers' mass retirement, with the last ones turning 65 in 2029. Not surprisingly, the Social Security Trust Fund is projected to not be able to cover all promised benefits starting in 2034. What are the solutions to this easy-to-see financial inflection? Well, the first, and thank you for the question, you know, um, and, and, and and I lament because my mother has worked her whole life and she is dependent upon it. She's depending on it and she should. She has paid in, she has paid her dues, but the math just doesn't work out. When it was originally when it, when it was originally envisioned, there were many more working people for the amount of people that were not working, and that has changed over time. And so the formula, understand it is a formulaic. It is it is driven by not by the Congress, but by a formula that was put in the legislation when it was when it was enacted. And that has to change at some point. Now, what is the answer to that? Because no one wants their Social Security touched, and nor should it be, especially as you reach your, close to your retirement age and you're counting on it and you have planned for that your whole life. You can't just pull the rug out of, uh, out of under people's feet. What has to happen at some point is that formula is going to have to change for younger folks. They're going to have to prior retire later, and folks that are paying in when, during their working years are probably going to have to pay a little more for the retirement in the future. Congress has been loath to take this up. The administration is loath to discuss it. It is one of the major drivers of our debt and deficit, and it is called autopilot spending. It happens regardless. There's nothing, it's, it's a great, autopilot spending is two-thirds of our debt. This is what we fight about in Congress every day, just like people and their families fight about, you know, their, their finances. This is what happens, and, and we have to come to a solution. I had signed on to a bill. Uh, last session, but we got very few co-sponsors because people are afraid to touch it because they get vilified in the public 
uh, and they get accused of taking away their parents' Social Security, which really isn't the case, but it's hard to explain to folks. So Social Security is sometimes referred to in certain circles as an entitlement. It is not an entitlement. It is an earned benefit. It is a benefit that all of the folks in this room are paying into right now and that our seniors have paid into for decades. And it's a promise that's been made by our federal government, a promise that needs to be kept and preserved. And that's exactly what I will do once elected. I'm open to discussions and to listening on things like proposed changes to the formula, but before we do that, we need to take a hard look at leveling the playing field for this. Right now, our Social Security Trust Fund, which as was pointed out, has an issue coming up in, in 2034. That fund could be fixed financially for upwards of potentially 40 years by simply lifting the cap on payroll taxes. So if you are single and you're making $128,000 a year, you pay the same amount of Social Security taxes as someone who's making $12.8 million a year and filing single. That doesn't seem fair to me. That doesn't seem like the concept that our nation was raised on. So let's take a look at that and making sure that the millionaires and billionaires in our society are paying their fair share to ensure that the Social Security system that we have, which has served us well, will be able to continue for decades to come. Okay, we're going to stay uh, on the financial side just for one more question here. And we're going to focus on the deficit. The federal deficit is projected to be $985 billion in fiscal year 2019. The national debt is about $21 trillion. I'm not sure what that number is. What should be done to address it or does it matter? And it'll be George Valdez. Well, it absolutely does matter, and we must address it. And um, certainly one of the ways to address that is through economic growth. We've had an economy that's been growing since 2008, and so that's <coughs> certainly part of the solution. Um, but this is an incredibly complex issue. If it was easy to solve, it would have been solved a long time ago. But it's one of these issues that requires bipartisan solutions. We need leaders in Congress who are sitting, willing to sit down and work with folks across the aisle and not be obstructionist. And so one of the things that I get tired of is folks who are constantly railing against deficits when there's a Democratic administration, and then who will turn around as soon as there's a Republican administration and vote for a tax cut that adds $1.5 trillion to the national debt. You can't have it both ways. All right? So what we have to do is we have to sit down and stop kicking this down the road, stop trying to leave a huge mess for our children and grandchildren, and I think to create a long-term solution we're going to have to get folks from both sides of the aisle to sit down and describe what is the end state that we want here and what are the courses of action that we can pursue to go after it. That's the way that it does, works in the military. That's the way it works in the private sector. That's the way it works in the federal government, uh, at least the pieces that I've served in. And that's what we need to do as we go forward as a nation. Uh, the Freedom Caucus has been obstructionist on this issue, and they, it's time for them to step aside and to allow a bipartisan approach to taking on national debt. This has one of, been one of the bellwether issues that I ran on and that I have fought about since I was elected to Congress and quite honestly when I was at the State House too, uh, as well. We make this much too complicated, folks. This is pretty simple, right? You don't spend more than you take in. That's as, easy, that's as hard as it gets, right? And somebody has to make hard decisions and you elect members of Congress to do that. Um, now, as far as being obstructionist, the freedom... The Freedom Caucus are the people that are actually trying to save the money, right? I just voted against the spending package. We have a 4.4% economy right now, 4.4, right? Which hasn't ha didn't happen in the, in, the, in the eight years of President Obama. It didn't get really above two, but we have it now in these, in these two years, and it continues. That's one of the answers to solving the debt crisis, because even though we provided a tax cut to every single person in the room, federal revenues are actually up. The federal government is taking in more money because people, more people are working, the economy is expanding, the economy is growing, there's more opportunity. What didn't happen is spending reductions. You don't reduce the, the deficit by taxing people more, right? taking more of their hard-earned money and, and making a disincentive to make more money and put your capital and put your money at risk. You save money by not spending as much. The, the bill that I just voted against to cut spending, 
It was spent $8 billion more this year for ledge branch, legislative branch. If you're not willing to cut the ledge branch and some of the other sundry things, you're not willing to cut anything. So I'm proud of that, Novo, because I don't want to spend your money on that kind of stuff. And sooner or later, members of Congress have to make tough decisions, and I've made them. You know, you, you do this long enough and you can kind of anticipate it. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. So I am all for being fiscally responsible, for making sure that we pay for the programs that we are supporting. But let's make sure we understand what's going on here. This tax cut was not a tax cut that our economy needed. Our economy was already growing. Tax cuts are a fiscal stimulus that are typically applied during periods of downward growth of the economy or contraction of the economy. Our economy was already growing. So all we've done is potentially introduce a risk of inflation that we will potentially have to deal with down the road. On top of that, these tax cuts were not distributed evenly. 83% okay? of the benefits from the tax cuts went to the top 1% of our society. That's not who we are, folks. That's not the way the system's supposed to work. Millionaires and billionaires didn't need nor did they ask for those additional tax cuts. And the supposed growth that was going to happen from corporations, in fact, was used for stock buybacks and dividend issues to folks who, frankly, were already doing pretty well to start with. So we need to be honest with each other about this and to figure out a way to work together to solve this issue. Okay, we're going to move on. Scott, you're going to answer the uh, first call by George. Uh, we're going to move into an interesting area, which is states' rights versus federal laws. There's an ever-increasing gulf between the states legalizing the growing and or use, or in some cases decriminalizing some form of marijuana. What is your position as far as the federal government's approach towards U.S. law and states' rights in these areas as potential conflicts that result? Well, like I said, each of us who, uh, who raises their right hand and takes an oath to uphold defend the Constitution, and it's all the Constitution, including the Tenth Amendment, which, which reserves for the state the rights to do all the things that aren't enumerated in the Constitution. And this is one where I think the federal government has gone, to, gone too far now. Five years ago, if you'd have told me I'd have been the champion in Congress as a Republican on, on a portion of medical marijuana, I would have told you you were probably smoking it. Uh, but I listened to the facts. I had a lot of constituents come in, and I said to my staff, listen, I'm on the wrong side of a portion of this here, and we have to do the right thing. I, I, I'm the prime sponsor and the first sponsor of a bill called the CBD bill, which is cannabidiol, which is an extract of the marijuana plant, which people that have seizure disorders can use to save themselves from the seizure disorders. And at that time, many of our constituents were literally traveling to Colorado to treat their children because it was illegal in Pennsylvania. I have fought for this issue as, uh, as hard as anyone has. Uh, we keep reintroducing it. We keep improving it. We have uh, co-sponsorship in the Senate. And actually, the Speaker supports it. I have had uh, significant pushback from my own party trying to get a uh, hearing on it and get it to the floor or in the committee for a vote. But uh, I think that these are the things that are reserved for the, to the rights of the, uh, of the states in this regard. Now, I'll tell you this, too. As you know, Pennsylvania passed its own medical marijuana law, and I think that's great because the states do lead the federal government often. But I want to be clear. I am not a recreational marijuana proponent, and I will tell you one good reason. We don't have a good way to test it when you're out on the road driving impaired, and I don't want my children or your children uh, subject to those uh, potential uh, accidents. Thank you. <coughs> Well, I'm happy that we have uh, legalized medicinal marijuana here in the state of Pennsylvania, and I think great credit goes to uh, Governor Wolf and to the State Assembly for doing that. That's a great example of bipartisan solutions. And I'll point out that uh, there were some Lutheran pastors involved in that and making sure that people understood why we needed to do that. Um, does that need to be imposed at the federal level? I, I don't necessarily think so. I think each state has a different culture on that issue. What we do need to take a hard look at, though, is, is this issue of decriminalizing marijuana. Because this is an issue that adversely affects people of color. There are many people of color who are in jail or who have criminal records because maybe they had a joint on their possession. And what you see in the enforcement of this law, it is uneven. It is affecting people and putting black marks on their record for the rest of their life, which then affects their ability to gain employment. 
So I don't support legalizing recreational marijuana, but I do think we need to decriminalize it and to take away the stigma and the penalty that goes along with that. And ideally, that will be enacted at the state level, but if we need to propose some legislation at the federal level and we can get bipartisan support for it, I'm certainly open to that. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move on to uh, a question on freedom of the press. That's where this might be going. The media under the current administration is viewed as public enemy number one. How do you view the local and national media, print and broadcast, and how do you feel, and what's your feelings reflect the intent of the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States, i.e., Congress shall make no law representing an establishing of religion or provoke the free exercise thereof or abridge the freedom of speech or of the press? So it is, the First Amendment is perhaps the most important part of our Constitution, and the media is essential to a functioning democracy. When the media is weakened as an institution, democracy is weakened. And you look at states that have totalitarian regimes or authoritarian regimes, and what do they lack? They lack a free media. So we absolutely need to continue to support and protect our media. Now, does media need to be responsible, and do they go overboard? Yes, they certainly do at times, on both sides of the political spectrum. Um, but to sit there and say that media is somehow the enemy of our government or our people is reminiscent of words that we heard during the Nixon administration in, this, in that mindset that came on them at the end of, of kind of paranoia. All right? We are all in this together, folks. We need the legislative branch, we need the executive branch, we need the judiciary, and we need a well functioning, strong media to keep the people of our society informed about what their leaders, both elected and appointed, are doing. And I absolutely believe that we need to continue to have those protections, and, and I'm not in favor of anyone who wants to try and restrict the media in our society. Well, I, look, again, support the entire Constitution, including the First Amendment, and I think there's a reason why it's the First Amendment. I will uh, push back on the characterization that anybody's trying to suppress a free media, but we all have opinions about the media, and I think that's fair. Uh, I like to think of the media as, uh, as the news media, but unfortunately I think in some cases it's not the news media, it's the media. And so from my standpoint, as I've grown up, I've learned that, and, and, and now the vehicles and the opportunities there to multi-source my information. I don't just trust one source, I look around, I verify the stories no matter where they are, to be informed and to be, quite honestly, correct. In this job, you want to be correct every single time before you make a statement. We all fall short, fall short on occasion, but I think it's important that we all do. But I am concerned about a media that purports itself as news on occasion and uh, is it, it, where it is not news. And I think it's right, and I think it's okay. This is America. We have the freedom of speech as well as the freedom of press and religion. If you want to if you want to criticize the media, that, that's your business, especially if you can point out opportunities where they have taken liberties and, and have kind of been a little fast and loose with the facts. But it's incumbent upon all of us uh, to inform ourselves, and I think it's also in this day and age incumbent upon all of us to multi-source our information. And I will also tell you that I'm concerned about some of the new media and what we call shadow banning, where you think you're sending a message to someone or you're posting or texting or what have you, and the media platform, so to speak, doesn't allow it to go through based on the content. That is very concerning to me. Okay. Very good, thank you. The next one is going to be on cyber security, and it's a simple, straightforward question. Do you believe that there should be a creation of the Department of Cyber Security for the United States? There is a Department of Cyber Security and Homeland Security, and they have the primary role of, uh, of, uh, of kind of administering our efforts, and I sit on the Homeland Security Committee and, and for a term I sat on the Cyber Subcommittee. This is a very intractable problem because, quite honestly, folks, of this thing right here, the Constitution of the United States, which gives us all our rights. It is intractable for the United States. It is not intractable for China. It is not intractable for Russia because they don't have this. But for us, we want to preserve our rights and our privacy, which makes it very difficult for us uh, to prevent these foreign actors from being involved while preserving your privacy at the same time. And government is moving at the speed of government while bad actors are moving at the speed of the electronics. So government continues to work on the issues and we work with our partners at both the state and local level, most particularly in the upcoming election. Homeland Security has been very involved in that in safeguarding our elections 
and I, I, I presume we will continue to do that. We've had multiple hearings on it. We have invested a lot of money in it to make sure that our, uh, our elections are not, uh, are not in, you know, encumbered. But um, it is a huge issue, and it is very difficult for us to deal with, and it's very difficult for individuals to deal with. We don't know. Look, I was, I was reading a thing today where there's literally a website where you can send multiple emails uh, to the same place, like tens of thousands of them from one location, many sent from Russia. It's very difficult for us to deal with that in a free society, but we must just continue to work on it very diligently and work with our state and local partners from the federal level. So as someone who spent uh, over 20 years in the intelligence community and in the uh, Department of Defense and in the Central Intelligence Agency, what I'll tell you is that uh, cybersecurity and uh, the challenges that go along with it uh, have been a long time coming and they're not going away. But our government uh, has already been proactive in, in going after this issue. I don't think we necessarily need to expand our government by creating another department solely dedicated to this issue. Um, we do have a variety of players in the national security community that actively work together underneath the authority of the executive branch to address this issue. In particular, I'm quite familiar, familiar with U.S. Cyber Command. I have uh, very close friends who work uh, in that community and have worked there for a long time. And much of the work that goes on is work that goes on um, unseen to all of us. Much of it is, uh, is monitoring and defending networks, both public and private, across our nation. And, uh, and these are folks that are, that are frankly silent heroes who every day are protecting our businesses, our government, and, uh, and other institutions of our society. And one of the most important things that we have to protect is our elections. Um, the, uh, there is no, uh, no way to dispute the fact that our elections in 2016 were interfered with deliberately by Russia. Uh, that should not be frankly a question. Um, I think other questions certainly are open to discussion, but we need to recognize that there's a threat exists and that it's not going to go away, that they're going to come back again. Um, and they're going to try and influence elections this year at the congressional level, and certainly they're going to be back again in two years. Okay, thank you. Uh, we want to give a nod to, uh, again, you, you're both having military backgrounds. Um, so, Congressman Perry, uh, what has been your involvement in defense spending appropriations? Mr. Scott, how would you pri prioritize or evaluate defense spending appropriations into both? Where would you uh, suggest the wisest place to spend our defense dollars? So, George, you're first. Okay, so the question is how would I evaluate and prioritize defense spending? Okay, well, I, I believe that the most effective use of defense dollars are um, at the point of the spear, so to speak. Um, too often, we have a lot of our defense spending that is being used uh, on things that are at the back end, administrative in nature. And certainly, we need administrators and, uh, and logisticians to be able to, to operate successfully. Um, but we have got to make sure that the force that we have is lean and, and designed to meet the threats of today. So we're not going to have another World War II. That's not going to happen. What the kind of threats we're going to have are threats that we have to respond to quickly and precisely. And so what we've done in our nation's military over the years is we have um, designed forces to deal with those kinds of threat, forces that can deploy rapidly, forces that are precise, both not only land but also sea and air. And so I think what we want to do in terms of our force design and our force structure is to focus our resources on that. And I do think we need to take a hard look at, at the defense contracting industry. I spent uh, over three years in the private sector in defense contracting. And I will tell you that I personally witnessed um, fraud, waste, and abuse. And I think there's a need for more oversight of that particular sector of our economy. That doesn't mean that everyone that works in that sector is bad. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that there are companies out there that are more interested in profit than in protecting and defending the, the United States and the people that we have. Can you, can you, I'm sorry, Mike, can you repeat my portion of the question? I can't remember. Uh, I, I, what has been your involvement in defense spending appropriation legislation? And then the last part is, what's the wisest place to spend those dollars? Is for sure. Okay, so I'm, in, I'm involved. Uh, chairman Schuster, who's chairman of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee in the House of Representatives, is also Pennsylvania's representative on the on the House Armed Services Committee, and I'm involved with him through uh, the discussions that I that I have with him about my knowledge of the defense industry and, and the defense of our country. But where it really starts is 
the national military strategy and the national security strategy. That's where defense spending starts because that's where we outline how we defend our country and who the malign actors are and then we focus our attention on them whether they're, whether they're state actors or non-state actors. Uh, whether they are building their military, what their intentions are. If you look at China right now, what their intentions are in the South China Sea, that informs us. What, if you look at the, mil the, the, uh, the situation in the Middle East, and, and especially Turkey and Syria and Yemen and Iran, that informs our decisions as well. Uh, one of the other things that I think is important to note here is, is that Pennsylvania has a large stake, state, stake in this as well. We are one of the largest guard state, national guard states in the Union. And recently, there was a change made regarding the Apache, the AH-64 helicopter. You as taxpayers across the country, and particularly in Pennsylvania, had paid dearly over the last 15 or 20 years to outfit the battalion of attack helicopters located in Indian Town Gap in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. And the Army saw fit to take them away from Pennsylvania with an improper process that didn't acknowledge the level and the depth of the experience here in Pennsylvania with those pilots and those airframes and those maintainers and the leadership and it's just it's just a travesty we fought and fought and fought but we lost with uh, with big army and uh, but that's kind of my involvement on a daily basis All right, we're going to squeeze in one last question before we go to our close and uh, you don't necessarily need to use the whole time unless you, you want to uh, but obviously uh, speaker Paul Ryan's going to be retiring we don't really know who's going to have control of Congress and so this is really a question for each of you as far as within your own party, uh, who are you going to support for leader? Um, because that person very well could be our, our next speaker. Speaker. Yeah, speaker. What did I say? Leader. That's, a, that's another post. No, speaker. okay, fine. Yeah, I'm looking for who, who could be our next speaker. My first speaker. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. I've already announced my support for Congressman Jim Jordan of Ohio, and I will tell you why. I've been, uh, I've been in Congress now under two speakers, Mr. Boehner and, uh, and Mr. Ryan, and both were fine individuals, uh, and, and uh, they each have their strengths and weaknesses, but there's something much greater than that, and that is the ability of rank-and-file members to participate. And too often, the power is decided at the top. There are literally a couple folks at the top of the House of Representatives and leadership, including the speaker, and in the Senate. And they decide what bills we're going to vote on, and they decide what amendments are going to be in order, or if any order, any amendments are going to be in order. This is not a reflection of anything. It's not. It's not personal. Uh, I, I also supported the effort for uh, to, for Mr. Boehner to step down because I thought he lost his ability to lead the House of Representatives effectively, and uh, and we weren't doing a good job. And and at this point, uh, unfortunately, we have more closed rules. And what that means is there's fewer opportunities for rank-and-file members to offer amendments. That's how we, that's how we support the, the members of our district is by participating. That's how we support our, our citizens. I didn't go to Congress, as I told the Speaker, to take orders. I joined another organization to do that. I came to Congress to participate and represent the people of the 4th District and hopefully the 10th District of Pennsylvania. And so if we, don't want, if we don't want things to change, we should vote for who leadership tells us to vote for. But if you want things, if I want things to change, I'm going to vote for Mr. Jordan because he's going to open up the process to everybody, Democrats and Republicans, and let the bills stand where they will. Jordan. So I believe we need new leadership within the Democratic Party, and um, I don't believe that uh, Representative Pelosi is the best choice for that. Um, above and beyond that, I find that a little bit ironic, uh, as we mentioned, uh, former Speaker Boehner. Former Speaker Boehner, when he left, specifically uh, studied the Freedom Caucus as being one of the main reasons for his departure, um, because they had been, again, obstructionist in nature and had stood in the way of, of legislation. So, um, Representative Jordan's a, a leader within the Freedom Caucus, and, uh, and I just I find that surprising that that's who we really want as a speaker in an age when bipartisanship is really what we desperately need. Okay, I'm not sure I really build in the rebuttal thing, but we're going to give you your opportunity. I gave you two cards, you can use them. That, that's a question, right? That was a question, right? And that's not the close, that was a question, nope. so I can rebut. Right? Absolutely. Uh, the characterization of the Freedom Caucus, folks, look, if you're going to listen to articles <coughs> from political out of Washington, D.C., written by Republican leadership, you're going to think exactly what my opponent thinks the Freedom Caucus is. Let me tell you, the Freedom Caucus is a process organization. It is not an ideological organization. What we want is for the bills to go through committee, 
have a chance to amend them, bring them to the floor, have a chance to amend them, and vote for them or vote on them. That's what we ask for. It's a process organization. And so when people say that we're obstructionist, what we're fighting for is what you asked us to do. What we want to do, what we want to be able to do in Congress is do what we said we were going to do when we campaigned. When you get to Congress too often, leadership says now to put their arm around you and say, look, if you just do what we tell you to do, everything's going to be fine and we'll help you back at home and you don't have to worry about what happens there. That doesn't work for me. That's why I joined the Freedom Caucus, because I want to support the people I came that I came to represent, not the people in Washington, D.C., and I reject the fact that it gets mischaracterized by people that don't know anything about it. Okay, very good. All right, we're going to move on to our closing, and uh, it will be uh, Scott Perry followed by George Scott. Thank you. Again, thanks to Rotary, and uh, congratulations on moving up a couple notches. And as you know, I've been to Rotary on many occasions, and I thank you for the work that you do around the world, particularly with some of your, your projects uh, that help the, our population all around the globe. I'll start out again with, uh, with my grandmother, the tough life that she led and the tough life that my mother led that, led, that, that brought me to, to where I am today. Again, we were on assistance and we struggled, but we never, look, we didn't complain, we made our own way. And I am proud to be surrounded by tough women that are capable. I have a wonderful wife who is a, uh, a human resources vice president and deals with about 40,000 employees. My chief of staff is a retired Army Lieutenant Colonel, and 70% of my staff in Washington, D.C. and the district are women because we pick the best person for the job when they come. I've been privileged to serve this nation in uniform, starting at the very bottom rung and working my way close to the top. And I've had great experiences in command and leadership positions. I've been privileged to start a business in this country, in this community, and pursue my dreams and employ people inside in the front side of a paycheck and understand the difficulties that employers and job creators have to deal with every single day, whether it's insurance, whether it's in taxes, or whether it's employment. Uh, I am concerned about our future for my mother on Medicare and Social Security. I am concerned, I'm concerned for my children and their future. I did vote for the tax cut, and, tax, and revenues are up, and also economic activity is up, job creation is up, unemployment is down, wages are up, I mean, if you contrast the last two years to the last eight years and tell, you, tell me it's anything, it's the same, uh, you know, obviously we see things very differently, but I see a vibrant economy, and part of that is the solution to things like Medicare and Social Security and Medicaid. So with that, uh, these are the things I fight for. I am honest with you every single day. I, I take a position, I take a stand, and I always will, and I explain it to you. And I just hope you'll consider supporting me in the new district, the new 10th district, and I thank you for your time and attendance. Well, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I began running for Congress last year because I was deeply concerned about the impact of the 2016 election, especially the divisiveness that it created. It was this divisiveness not just in our, in our communities, but also in congregations and even in families. And I began running because I was and am deeply concerned about the struggles of so many families right here in South Central Pennsylvania. There are too many people that are working harder and harder and cannot make ends meet. I'm running to restore integrity to our political process, to promote policies that will serve all the people, and that will move us forward together as both a district and as a nation. Now, you've had an opportunity to hear from both of us and hear our views on a variety of topics. So really what it comes down to is which vision of the future do you want to follow? Is it a vision that's narrowly focused on the interests of a particular group or on the interests of many? Or do you want a vision of an open, bipartisan approach, an approach that will, that will seek to find solutions to tough issues, that will move us forward in a way that serves all the people, and that will make sure that not just a particular caucus is, or a particular party is benefiting. You know, South Central Pennsylvania has changed a lot in the past decade. And it's time for our leadership in Congress to reflect that change, to bring integrity, service, and compassion to D.C., to bring your voice to Washington, D.C. And that's what I'm going to do. This is a new district. It deserves new direction. It needs new representation in Washington, D.C. And my promise is that when elected, I will work for you and you only. My name is George Scott, and I thank you, and I ask for your vote on November 6th. Thank you, George. All right.
We have two outstanding candidates. I would ask that all of us thank them for their time.